What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside Ryan Sullivan. And uh, me and Ryan were actually just talking about this right before we went on. But the, 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 this game, man, it was it went late. We were zombies the next morning. Um, but before we really get into it, just just what a huge win this was for, for, for the Bills. I mean, to me, Ryan, this was such... I know the players... We're saying all week that this is just, you know, just week five. You know, it's the it's the most important game because it's the next game. You know, cue, cue any cliche you want when you're kind of talking about a game. But I feel like you could tell early on that they really, really wanted this game real bad. And it was kind of that statement when I feel like we've been waiting for as fans for kind of a while where the whole nation got to just see what we've been seeing the last four weeks. And it, it was it was just really awesome to watch. I was just reading a Dobus Gailey article before this, and this really is, was he called it a watershed moment for the team. And it was a watershed moment for the team. You, you you think about the last, let's say, 22 years of Bill's football here. Is there a bigger win than this when you consider the domination and the opponent that they played? I don't, I don't think there was many people legitimately predicting a Bill's multiple possession victory. And it, it's just, I I don't think there's any way you can really quantify how big of a win this was for this team and what, what it really feels like for this fan base. It feels like, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm not going to call it revenge for last year because they still got a win in the, in the postseason. But it's just something that, I won't say out of left field because they've been playing really good football lately, but just something that I, I know neither of us expect. I know I picked Kansas City to win I did that too, game. Yeah. We both picked Kansas City to win. So it was just it, absolutely incredible. And I actually even think Greg might have picked Kansas City to win too. I think all three of us picked KC. I might be wrong. Maybe Greg too. I think Greg, I think I, I think Greg, I think Greg, Greg might have been the one guns. believer. I think Greg he, I think Greg picked Buffalo. He, yeah, he might have the one who had some balls there and picked Buffalo. But uh no, but in and in, in not only just that, Ryan, I think that this was such like a mental hurdle. This team finally got over because last year this was the only team that really gave them problems and was a issue for him twice and i think that they were able the fact that they were able to go in there get a win i think it also let them know and i know they they do believe that they could beat anybody but i think it really showed them that there is really there there arguably is not a team better than the bills in the nfl and i think last night not only showed us fans that for real the, the way that game went but also really showed i think this team these players that you know, they are as good as advertised. And I, I just think the fact that they were able to get past the big bad Mahomes. I mean, everyone was saying this was like for Michael Jordan, the Bulls, he had to get over the Pistons, right? At some point, the bad boys Pistons. And eventually he did. And for, and once they did, it's, you know, it ended the Pistons dynasty and opened up their dynasty. And I'm not suggesting that that is what's going to happen here with Buffalo. I certainly hope that it does, but it, it had that feeling to it where, you know, they finally beat a team that it had their number, that everyone was saying, you know, we're not going to put you into that Super Bowl conversation until you can prove you can beat them. And listen, they more than proved they could beat them on Sunday night. And the Bills are in the driver's seat now to make the playoffs go through Buffalo. You know, you got yep. L.A. at 4-1, and one, who also has a win over Kansas City. But they're not playing games the way Buffalo's playing games right now. They don't. They're not averaging 35 points a game and averaging 12 points allowed per game. the eight, Buffalo surplanted itself as the team to beat in the AFC. And Kansas City, it's going to be really hard for Kansas City to jump the Bills at this point with a two-and-a-half game lead. And the only game the Bills aren't going to be favored in is Tampa Bay going forward. This the, the game coming up right now might be the second-hardest team they have left on their schedule. So it the trajectory of the bills right now, I just, I just think can't be, can't be understated enough or can't be overstated enough. And you talk about Josh Allen and what this means to him, you know, there was a couple more things that you can maybe pick at him from Not that it was ever really truly a legitimate concern. I think among serious fans or serious people who, who really understand football, but can Josh Allen play in front of crowds or can he play in front of hostile crowds? Well, he played in front of a, Fully packed, fully revved up Arrowhead Stadium. Can he play in elements? It, the first half, the rain held off, thank God. It was very much raining in that second half. And he did exactly what he had to do in that second half. 
So just hurdle after hurdle out of the way. And I mean, and, and the results speak for themselves today in the national media, ESPN, um, a lot of, almost everyone has Buffalo as their one or their two in their power rankings right now. And, I, you know, looking at these, at, at the ramifications of what this means to the playoffs, I wrote about this uh, in my Thursday thought column, which you can uh, read on the buffalofanatics.com. I talked about how important, how crucial a win on Sunday was going to mean for them as far as getting this one seed. And the Bills going into this week, and things have changed, of course, teams have won and whatnot, but going into week five, all right, ex- you know, the Bills combined records of their opponents they have upcoming was 19 and 33 heading into this week. They have the easiest schedule in the NFL. And I think it was um, Aaron Sh- uh, Chance, I believe, who who tweeted said the bill, the Bills win on Sunday, according to his analytics, they have a 50 percent chance of getting the one seed. And if they lost, it would have been about 12. And they have effectively, I mean, like we, we just said, I mean, besides Tampa, they're going to be the favorite in every single game they play. And I think that this team has put them squarely on the path. Like you said, get that one seat, get that buy in the playoffs. And I think most importantly is have home field throughout and have to have every team come through Buffalo in January in the wind and the cold in the snow and try to go beat them with that hostile crowd with Bill's mafia. So I, I, I mean, this win for them, was, it was huge. And it was, I mean, from a, just as a fan perspective, Ryan, you and me are definitely drought era Bills fans. You know, we're both in our 20s. So all we grew up on, you know, the, those ugly navy blue uniforms and Trent Edwards, you know, checking it down. I mean, that was the football we grew up on. And just from a fan's perspective, just to see the, how far this team has come. The fact that they walked on Sunday Night Football against the best of the best of the NFL with Kansas City and just beat them up and frankly could have won the game by even more um was just really from a fan perspective it, it was such a special moment i thought well and, and just to get into the specifics on the offense josh was four four on deep balls on sunday and each one was impressive in its own right you know most impressive the emmanuel sanders touchdown there is maybe three humans on earth who can throw a football that way from that distance uh, unbelievable Timing, unbelievable accuracy. He, Emmanuel Sanders said in his post game press conference that he didn't even know what to do once it got there because he just it, he wasn't expecting that. It just a, an all world throw that not many people who have lived on planet Earth throughout human history can make. They protected the ball. They didn't even put the ball on the ground on offense. Isaiah McKenzie had a kickoff he put on the ground while it was raining, but they protected the ball every. Uh, there was nobody they they didn't give them any plus field position during the game just that that's how you win football games and they did it without really they the offense was i think the chiefs had more plays i think when when it was in the fourth quarter that there was a point where the chiefs had 60 plays and the bills had 30 plays they didn't have the ball a ton of the time they were just super super efficient you have dawson knox continuing to be on now a record-breaking streak for bills tight end on pace for 800 yards on this team, the the style that they're winning in offense is just so sustainable. And one more thing to, to touch on here is the balance in this offense. And I know we talked all off season about, well, we don't need to run more. We need to run more efficiently, but I think where they are, they're running in, they're running in good situations. They're running in situations where it does make sense to run and they're getting production out of there. Zach Moss had 73% of the snaps last yesterday, and I know his yards per carry wasn't great. It was like 4.2, but he was a monster catching the ball. I know he had one drop, but he looks every bit the, the guy we were seeing towards the end of last year. It's just there's this offense isn't quite the same offense as it was last year, but it just I think it can get you in so many more ways this year than just Josh Allen go do something. Yeah, a couple of things I want to touch about the offense. Number one, Zach Moss. I'm really glad you brought up him because he was someone I wrote down in my notes. And I know that I had said, I believe it was maybe a week or two um, earlier, that I don't think there's an RB1 in this offense. I think it is really the hot hand. I, I, I'm i starting to back away from that. I do think that Zach Moss, I mean, it's been now three straight weeks of him eating into Singletary snaps. And frankly, I would say Zach Moss, it's not even like he's playing like the guy we saw last year, I'd go a step farther, Ryan. He's looking like the guy that we saw at Utah, you know, 
seeing the way he's making guys miss in the open field and the quickness he has. Yes, he doesn't have the long speed, but that jitter that he's got a little, you know, a little like jitterness to him that's making guys miss and he's running hard. And I, I've been really impressed with him. And, and the fact of the matter is, you know, yes, I don't know if he's as good as a route runner as say Singletary, but Zach boss just seems to just catch the ball a lot more naturally than Devin, you know, and, and Josh really does have faith in him. I mean, Josh targeted him a couple of times. I think, I think Moss ended the game with 55 yards receiving, which is great to get out of your backfield. So that's huge. And I think you have to tip your hat to the offensive line because for two straight weeks now, effectively the same rotation, except this time Feliciano in, they've done a very good job protecting Josh Allen, opening up the running lanes. I mean, you saw the way they, on that first drive with all those quarterback runs, how they bullied that Casey front, you know, just on that drive alone. I mean, I, I've been very impressed with how that front five have been playing so far for this offense. Shout out to Casey. Shout out to Pierre. Spencer Brown is a fucking tank. He yep. watching him on those pin and pulls. That's something that didn't exist on this team last year. That first, those first couple quarterback sneaks. He's just in space wrecking dudes. There's a couple, and you can search Twitter, and people are clipping up stuff. And um, I, we, I try to do that. I'm not. Uh, I don't think I have all access to all 22 yet. I don't know where people are getting this. This where this black market is. But he's throwing dudes. He's chucking dudes. He's mean. He's he brings something this offensive line desperately, desperately needed. And like I we we said, we don't want Spencer Brown sorry on this line this year. And if if he is, something's gone wrong. Well, something went wrong. The, the, the line was terrible for the first two weeks, but he's been just an absolute delight to have out there. And I, I don't, I think he's really been an agent of change on this team. And just, I think one more, just one more thing to really touch on this offense. This game was really well played called by Brian Dable. I know there was people that weren't in love with the play calling the last two weeks. And I, I think we both agreed early on that I think a lot of it more was on Josh and Dable. There was some really, they've been going to a lot more heavy personnel. Greg was talking about that last week with us, a lot more two tight end looks running out of that stuff. And then they had like, one of my favorite plays of the game, I think was the second or third quarter. Uh, Zach Moss had a drop and they came back with like a 22 personnel. They had uh boss and, Gilliam in the backfield and they had Knox and um, Sweeney on either end and they ran kind of like this fake end around play and then not uh, it was the play Moss got in everyone just took off uh, down the field and Zach Moss was just sitting there in the middle of the field with like 20 yards to run up field just really solid play calling on that kept drives alive and it's you know not to harp on it too much beyond that, but it just I, I don't think there's enough great things we can say about the way the offense have played. Besides, you know, th- you know, and the only thing you could really talk about is they left a few points off there. But what do we always talk? We always say, well, you can't leave points on the board because the Kansas City won't let you. Won't Kansas City will will get you if you did that? Well, they left eleven at least eleven points on the board against Kansas City, and it didn't come back and bite them. No, no, no. I mean. That's the, that, and that's where I think you realize that this team is is different than what we saw from last year. Because, listen, and again, this is where like I think like as fans, sometimes you have to take a step back for and and really look at things. Like we're talking like last couple of weeks. Oh, the Bills' offense could have played better. The Bills have scored forty and thirty eight points the last two weeks. Like that still is going to win you games if you're putting up points like that. And you know, I think also to, to go back, you know, or I think Ryan, what, what went wrong with this offensive line? You know, real quick, we talked about with Spencer Brown was what was Cody Ford sucks. That's what went wrong, which you and me, you know, missed took an L. Was that Co- took an L. If we took a fat L on that one. You and me defended Cody Ford and he, you know, he's just, uh, I, we, we touched on a lot last week, but yeah, that's what went wrong. No, but like you said, though, this Dable, I think, called a really, really good game. I agree with that. I think that. And, and, and what made me happy too, Ryan, was that we were playing like the Chiefs defense, right? W- coming into this game was arguably one of the worst in football. And I feel like at times we've seen the Bills, you know, when they play teams kind of like that, where it's like, oh, like good team, but defense is the, for them is a little shaky. And the Bills don't seem to like dominate offensively like you would want. And I think it would, again, when we're talking about kind of mental hurdles and, and, and the maturation of this football team, I think the fact that they went in there against a bad defense and made them look worse. I mean, what was all the talk Monday morning after this game? 
it wasn't about Buffalo. It was, wow, that Kansas City defense is an absolute shitstorm. And I think you have to credit Buffalo for, for making them look like that in a weird way. I know they've been allowing tons of points, but they looked inept. And I, I just think that, you know, yes, I don't, the execution, especially in, in, in that second half, wasn't great, but this was kind of my last point. I wrote down the offense, and we can get into the defense after this, but at the end of the day, Ryan, despite what had gone on in the game, what, it, what had transpired, right? When the Bills needed that last final drive to put the game away, that offense came through. Josh Allen wheeled that drive together. That was an eight-minute drive that went the whole length of the field, resulted in a touchdown, a 100% put the game away, and the fact is that the Bills have an offense that, that, that how many times had we seen the Patriots, right, do that to teams with Tom Brady, where they would just, that one drive that they needed, they'd always get it. And to see that this offense against a top team, primetime game, right, when the momentum had clearly shifted on, K, on Kansas City's side, that they were able to get it together and drive and put that drive together for for that touchdown to Manuel Sanders, I think that, that that to me was like how I, at least after that drive, I felt, okay, this this team is truly ready to go and win a Super Bowl. Because to me, that was a Super Bowl caliber drive. Absolutely. And I'll, 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 I'll switch over to defense here. But I think my favorite stat, one of my all-time favorite stats now, that having 300 yards on 15 completions is bonkers. To me. Unheard of. 15 completions for three, wild. And I, I think that sums up the night incredibly well um and on to defense now i think the defensive game was more impressive than the offensive game plan mm-hmm. and the, they're not doing anything crazy and and you know my, my brother i was talking to him after the game and brought up a really good point that that first drive those first couple of drives where kansas city just kind of slowly matriculated its way downfield got a field goal got a touchdown and it would have been really easy for for Leslie Frazier and Sean McDermott to say the things we were saying, and luckily we're not defensive play callers, that we were saying earlier, at least I was saying last week, that let's bring some pressure, let's bring some other guys and try to steal a possession that way. They didn't. They didn't blitz once in this game. And they just said, we're going to rush four, we're going to play too high, and we're going to try to make you beat them. And I think this game, I think holding the Chiefs at 20 is more impressive than shutting out the Texans or more impressive than shutting out Miami because of what this offense can do. I think one of the things that really stands out to me when you go back and watch the game is Kansas City didn't have a lot of yak yards in this game. The coverage in this game was unbelievable. You know, you even the, you go to the pick six that Micah Hyde had. had he, let's say Tyreek Hill catches that. Micah Hyde is laying him out. Micah Hyde was coming downhill ready to not knock him in the next week on that play. Every time someone got a catch, there wasn't a whole lot of yards after that. It's exactly what McDermott in this defense preaches. Rally, you know, keep it in front and rally the tackle. And they did that, and you saw it. Eventually, Mahomes started taking shots. He held onto the ball. And I, I think really one of the plays of the game, I tweeted this in the show account today, that the play of the game for me was with 150 left in the half when the Bills wanted to get the ball back for one more touchdown. They had the fourth down on when Casey had the ball in plus territory. And Mahomes holds the ball for eight seconds. And they keep him in the pocket for one, contain him, don't let him get outside either way. And for eight seconds, nobody gets open. He forces a ball in the double coverage and no one gets open. That I that there is the story of the game on defense. Just an amazing, amazing execution of a well-called game plan. I think that you could put this game, you could argue that this was the best defensive performance and game plan that McDermott and Frazier have ever put together. I would put this, the only thing, the only one that had challenged it, I think, Ryan, was maybe that playoff game last year against Baltimore, where they held them to three points and shut down the Lamar Jackson run game. But like other than that, like I, I, I think that this is their best offensive performance ever under under McDermott and Frazier. They the patience that Leslie Frazier showed on Sunday night was incredible. 
on six, I think it was 63 dropbacks or 53 dropbacks. I, I'm not sure exactly what the number was. It was something around there. The Bills blitzed once. One singular time in this entire game. They then the the um just the, the the patience that the Leslie Frazier displayed was just really incredible. And and on top of that, you have to tip your hat, Ryan, to this defensive line because I said going to this game, I said we're gonna find out. That that was the biggest thing, right? That Brandon Bean had put tons of resources into this offseason was all about getting pressure on Mahomes with four. And guess what? They got pressure on Mahomes before. Despite the fact, Ryan, that they only blitzed once in this game, 25%, a quarter of Mahomes' dropbacks, he was pressured on. That's huge if you're Buffalo. That's monstrous that they can generate pressure with just four. And we already know that this team in the back half and in the back of that defense, you know, they can cover as well as anybody. So the fact that they don't need to take any of those guys out of coverage to get pressure on the quarterback in general, not even just the Chiefs, but just in general, is humongous for this team. I mean, I can't say it enough. Yeah, I, I you know, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later when we give out our gold star. But I was so impressed with Gregory Rousseau. I think he was oh. really, I, I would, outside of this, you know, some of the secondary plays, the player of this game because it's not just the interception. The first play that really stood out was that play where they tried to get to the outside and he just held Lucas Niang off until he couldn't any longer and stopped him for a loss. I, there was a third down stop that he had in the pick. I mean, in that pick, if he's six, six, he doesn't make that play, but at six, seven, he makes that play and just a wildly athletic play. And there was other plays where they where Kansas city had to change their play calling around him because of what he was doing on the edge. There was one play where chiefs kind of ran like an orbit motion, or they were doing something where they were trying to get the ball out to the, to his side. And he got his hands in the passing lane and Mahomes had to go to the other side and it ended up being a short gain to the running to to the running back. There was another play where Lucas Niang chip blocked him because they didn't want him to get his hand up in the passing lane. He was affecting the way Kansas City was playing. And I put this out yesterday that for a draft where we liked Mitch, but we said, hey, we might not see the payoff from this and it wasn't just a, a lot of people saying hey it, it's just not going to be a draft that necessarily pans out this year Rousseau not only being a contributor but being a meaningful contributor and playing a big role in wins like he did yesterday is just an at is gravy and and just another and there's more you know we're we're five games in his career but to this point is just another feather in the cap of Brandon Bean and John McDermott and Leslie Frazier just putting in in places to succeed. Well, you know, we I I guess Ryan, we should we should have listened to Brandon Bean because I remember after that draft, he said this is a draft not just for the future. This is draft for this series. Like, don't get it wrong. These guys are going to help us win. And I kind of thought that he was just saying that to say that, but no, he was right. And again, I know it's only been five games, but through five games, Greg Rousseau looks to be like he looks to be like the Bills might really have something on their hands with him. I mean, he's got in the throughout five games, he's a rookie. He's got three sacks, a pick, a bunch of tackles. You know, he's got he's deflected some passes. I mean, he and 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 the biggest thing about Greg Rousseau, which is something I feel like everyone focused on the sacks, right? With him coming out of college, the, although the 15 and a half sacks he had, his run defense is awesome. I mean, he he had that one run, I think it was on third and two, where they ran away from him. When you talk about affecting the game, they ran away from him. I think with Darrell Williams. And Rousseau from the backside chased him down and tackled in the backfield for like a two yard loss. I mean, it was a great play by Rousseau. And he, he to me, I think was probably the most impactful player on the defense in that game. I mean, he, like you said, the Chiefs had to adjust what they were doing because of him. And to get to have the mighty Chiefs have to adjust their game plan because of a rookie, I mean, incredible by Greg Rousseau. And I'm, I'm, so excited to see when he just gets because for him, it just I think at this point, the more he plays, I think the better he's going to get and the more like nuanced he'll be at that position. Because I, I think for him, um, he, he could really be a stud on this defense because he's been impressive so far through five games. Yeah, it, it's incredible. And, you know, one more thing to touch on before we get into maybe some just areas of concern, if, if there's any area of concern from this game is that I think one thing that really separates the McDermott Bills from the Drought Bills is 
the officiating this game. And I don't think it was one-sided. I just think they were in incompetent staff. I think there were really bad calls on both sides. I think the roughing the passers were bad, were just the correct call on really bad rules. But that's a I think previous versions of the Bills get some of those calls, the Trey White uh pass interference, some of those holds early on that they're calling and they start to implode. And they didn't do that. They very easily could have spiraled after some of those early penalties that kept drives alive for Kansas City. And that speaks to the top down of this organ uh, uh you know the leadership of this team. And so they just there's really so little to pick apart from this game. Is there anything that you watched in this game that you said, huh, maybe that's something to watch that they can improve on in this game? You know, there 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 isn't much. Um the 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 one of the things I think for this game that I'd like to see the Bills not do, and and, and it was a little disheartening to see, just because I think last season they had it, it seemed like they had eliminated this issue, and it kind of popped back last night. Um, but it's like this like killer instinct of when you had a team, you know, clearly you know struggling against you, and you have a chance to just put them away, um, put them away. Score a touchdown, you know, get get just end the game. And, you know, the Bills didn't get burned by it. And and last year they didn't get burned by it either. But, you know, that third quarter, that pesky third quarter, we always talked, you know, we talked about so much, I feel like last year about the Bills. Um well they didn't it, score it, an it, offense, it, they, they didn't score an offensive touchdown in that third quarter. Today. Yeah, exactly. You know, their offense their offense went three and out, but essentially three times. I mean, you take away that long ball to Dawson Knox where he, you know, caught kind of mossed the defender. I mean, they would they were about to go three and out on that drive too. That was third and ten with that play so it's you know they didn't do it a ton last year they they stopped doing it last year it, it popped up last night but i just want to see them like especially because like a team like the chiefs who i know the defense is playing lights out but this is kansas city I mean, this is Mahomes, hill kelsey i mean that's that's a top notch offense i would just like to see them when they have the chance to really end the game and put it away just like come on you know get it over with you know end the game i mean i even tweeted i was like let's just can we just score a touchdown already just just to put this team away finally and, and eventually they did um but if that's my only qualm right is that like oh they 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 you know i wish they scored a touchdown sooner in the second half i mean you know there's not i guess that what i'm trying to say is there's not much to really be upset with this game this game with but that was one thing for me that um sort of bothered me how about you I mean, regardless if it's the Chiefs, regardless if it's the Jets, regardless if it's the Chargers, regardless if it's Jaguars, you have to put teams away. And I I think you are on to something that I think they did let them hang around longer than they should have. You know, early in the game, you get a turnover and plus territory, you got to put points on the board. That was unacceptable. That you, you need to put mm-hmm. up points on the board there, like period. The the couple red zone possessions coming off the the step step on nigs catch you got to get a touchdown there so there there were points in the game where they could have put this game away earlier and luckily Kansas the defense was playing lights out but the defense might not always be playing lights out Kansas mm. you know Mahomes you know we can the defense played well Mahomes missed some throws Mahomes is not always going to miss those throws and he was bouncing some passes and he just seemed to be having an, an off day and he's not always going to be doing that so I, I think I, I have it in my notes is stepping down their throat. I just think this is a team that if you want to look for areas of growth from this game, it's just stepping down their throats earlier and not having to wait until, and granted it was still 11 point game when they went on that last drive, but not waiting until five minutes left in the game to really ice the game. And that that's really it. You There's nothing you can talk about on defense that is particularly concerning. And just, I, I think, just continuing to try and be a better red zone team. and But besides that, it, it was just a super strong game. So in this super strong game, Mitch, do you, who was your our gold, who was your gold star player of the week? Uh, this one's tough because I feel like there was a lot of great performances. Um, I think I have to give it, though, to Leslie Frazier. Um, because I think Le- Le- Leslie Frazier, I mean, I already 
was someone who had a lot of belief in Leslie Frazier. I think that when the Bills defense was struggling last year and people were, you know, saying that he needed to get fired and all that stuff, I thought that was crazy. And I think that he's proven that he is an elite defensive play caller and, and game planner. And I mean, he just, I mean, he stifled the Chiefs. I mean, Patrick Mahomes was frustrated. Visibly, you could tell he was frustrated. He didn't know they confused him. They made him have to be, you know, methodical and and, and kind of checked out. And eventually, they were right. He caved in and tried to, you know, throw the ball in some tight windows and push the ball down the field. And he, you know, had some turnovers. And I just think that you, Leslie Frazier, just to me was was just incredible in this game. So he's getting my gold star. How about you, Ryan? I so I was gonna go Leslie Frazier, and I'm glad you did. I was gonna split my star between him and Gregory Rousseau, but we already talked about Gregory Rousseau. So I'm going off my notes here, and I think the player of the game is is Josh Allen. I know that's a cop out answer, but you talk about what star quarterbacks are and what it means to have a top three quarterback in the league and what it means to be a franchise quarterback. It's showing up on Sunday night football against the two time defending AFC champion and just balling out and having a game like that, because it was not just his passing. He was running all over them. And I know it's just one play, but, I mean, the hurdle play is just a quintessential Josh Allen play. He was did everything. There's nothing he really did wrong. The misses he had weren't really even misses as much as he was just, there was nothing there, so he threw it away, or he just overthrew it. There wasn't really throws that he necessarily missed today. And it, it, Everything, if there was any lingering questions about the way Josh started this year, they shouldn't exist anymore because this was, uh, I-, I think, an all-time game. And my next question, and I skipped this when I went to Gold Star, so we're going backwards. Do you have a turning, what was your turning point in this game, Mitch? So real quick, just Josh Allen, I'll, I'll, I'll just say this real quick. I mean, to, f- Josh Allen, Ryan, I think that that performance last night was an MVP like performance. I mean, that's one of those games that you that's going to stick out to voters at the end of the season. And people said that put him right squarely on the MVP map again. So, uh, yeah, he played a great game. I don't see where you could possibly uh, take anything away from him for that one. But for me, my, my turning point of the game was that Michael Hyde pick six. I think I mean, I think after that pick six, I'm not saying that I necessarily, you know, took a had like a sigh of relief or anything because it was still the Chiefs. I was still on edge for that game for a long time. But I think at that moment, it, it just kind of finally really felt like different versus what we had seen last year, where this team was clearly ready to take them down. And aside from just being a great play, I mean, at the end of the day, the Chiefs they never kind of they never really recovered from that. I mean, it was an 18 point game, sure they scored a touchdown, but their offense just looked so dejected after that play and I just think that, that it was at that moment where I really believed that this team was not only going to win this game but that it, it kind of occurred to me like, you know, ho- holy shit, we're destroying the Chiefs in their own building. So for me that that was my turning point in the game. How about you though? I got the Dawson Knox touchdown, the 50 yard touchdown. The okay, that's a good Knox. one. That's a, that's a huge play because too. Because you look at where they were in the game. Kansas City was driving. They get stopped on first down. Buffalo gets a chance. Buffalo is getting the ball back out to start the half. So they have a chance to double dip. Uh, as Greg Thompson says in scoring at the start and then scoring before the half and at the end of the half. And that's what good teams do. They, they had a seven point lead. And they could have got, they could have, you know, previous versions of this Bills, like we talked about, maybe run that clock out, maybe settle for a field goal. And to trust Josh to go downfield and, and make a play like he did speaks to how talented this offense and speaks to the trust in this team. And that is what good teams do is they, they put games away or not put games away early, but they, they put teams in a hole. And I know, Technically, it wasn't a double dip because, or was wouldn't wouldn't have been a double dip even if they scored at the start of the half because Casey technically got a field goal going into the half. But still, just I I think just a massive moment that I don't know if even necessarily maybe last year's Bills make in that in in that moment. No, absolutely, that's that, that's a great one. I mean, Dawson Knox. We even talk about Dawson Knox. Well, we I mean we talked about him briefly, but he he's been. Um, He's been just absolutely fantastic for this team. And right, just, and it's interesting too, right? I actually kind of want to ask you this. This is kind of off notes, but 
you know, Cole Beasley barely played in this game. Uh, if you look, I think he, he only played like 25, 28% of the snaps, something like that, less than 30%. Do you think that Dawson Knox is kind of taking Cole Beasley's role? Because he's shown that he can also be that move the six guy. I mean, he's had a couple moments throughout the year. I mean, do you think that, that maybe Dawson Knox is turning to that number three option behind Diggs and Sanders at this point? I think or do you think that was maybe just game planning? I, I mean, I think it's twofold. I think I think Sanders and is can do everything Cole Beasley can do and also be a deep threat, which Cole Beasley's not. And Dawson Knox can be he's getting a little bit better at in, at being a blocker. He's being he's become a functional blocker as a tight end. And he's a, probably more athletic than Cole Beasley is. And I don't think it's necessarily a knock on Cole Beasley. I just think the emergence of these two has been able to change the way this team plays. And I don't know if the correct term would be phased out or I, in you know, I, I just think if they've been running so much more heavy personnel as compared to last year, that I, I think there's just, it's harder for him to find snaps and find, you know, find plays that are, are going to go to him with the way they're playing this year as compared to last year. And, and on the note of Cole Beasley only playing 22 snaps on Sunday, do you have a, out of that whole game, I know it's tough, do you have a an LVP uh, of someone who, who stuck out as bad? Because it's hard to find. I had to really think about it for this one. It, it, it's very hard to find. And, and mine might not be one that initially came to people's mind, but it was something I noticed throughout the game. Um, so mine's actually Jerry Hughes. And... The one thing that Jerry Hughes was doing and kept on me last night that drove me crazy. And I saw a few people tweeting about it, so I, I'm glad. I, this was, which is why I wrote this down because I thought maybe I was just crazy. Is he was the only DN that kept on trying to like spin back inside, and he kept on allowing Mahomes to escape the pocket and extend plays and run with his legs. When the whole thing with Mahomes is just contain him, force him to stand in that pocket. And, and make a throw. And every DN for the Bills was doing that, except Hughes. And I think eventually they just took Hughes out of the game. I don't remember really seeing him very much at the end of it. Um, and they played a lot of group. Even Addison, I thought, played a good game. So for me, I, 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 Jerry Hughes, just, has, he's, he's been very quiet this season and didn't play a great game on, on Sunday night. But um, my only other LVP is the refs. I had to do a special shout-out with them. They were, I agree with you, Ryan. I don't think they were necessarily biased. They were just horrible. I mean, it was one of the worst officiated games I think I'd seen in a while, and especially for a matchup that big, you hate to see the refs become such a part of the game, which is what they did. Um, but sticking to an LVP for the Bills, uh, I'm I'm going Jerry Hughes. How about you? I have, and I'm going to sound like a scoring lover here. Isaiah <laughs> McKenzie, he's just he he had a fumble. You got to catch that, and he's just he's not. He's had a couple good returns, but you take away the couple good returns, and he's not doing a whole lot in the return game, but I'm not going to sit here and say return, bring Stevenson up, even though I think they should. He just, he, I, I think he's not doing as much as we thought a, as a returner on this team. He's good for me, you know, every once in a while, gain a good return, I guess. And he just hasn't been as effective as we want. Everyone was talking about, Oh, well, he can be a slot guy. He can be a slot guy. How many catches does he have this year? It's not a lot. So I think Isaiah McKenzie, and I, I think it's also just like Cole Beasley, a function of how this offense is playing this year. But he's just not, he hasn't been the guy that I think was hyped up all, all off season. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, half review is probably eye rolling. Of course, you know, you, you pick McKenzie. I know, the, 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 the YouTube comments <laughs> are going to be real mean to me this week. I'm going yeah, oh to put this on Twitter just to. I'm going to ask Brother Bill on this one. <laughs> no, but, you know, you're not wrong, though. You're not wrong. I mean, but we should preface this by saying there really wasn't, this was not an easy thing to pick for. I mean, it, it no one really played a bad game necessarily. Like, and that's the thing. Sometimes with picking something like an LVP, like there are times where we, where we look at this and go, who really even had a truly bad game? But, uh, uh, but there we go. So, but Ryan, we, we should get into it though with this, with Tennessee, because, you know, this is, an interesting game, I think, coming up, and I'm, and I think that this is going to tell us a lot about the Bills because they just came off this emotional, you know, huge win, and they got to reset and play on another primetime game on the road against Tennessee. Now, I know Tennessee isn't, I think, at the level that we're seeing out of teams like the Bills, the Chargers, the Ravens, to name a few, um, but this is still a good team and a good team that, when healthy, 
has got a ton of weapons. So starting with kind of this Bills offense versus this Bills defense, Ryan, is there a particular matchup that you're really looking for? I mean, it's a secondary. They they didn't do a ton to help their secondary. That was the big issue last year. And yeah, uh, Caleb Farley hasn't come quite out, come along yet. This is what I learned in doing research. You know, throughout the year, you know, throughout the season's always like, oh, this guy plays for this team. Do you know J- Norris Jenkins is a Tennessee Titan? Because I, I actually, I, I actually do believe it or not. That was, I, I was watching Red Zone uh, over the or the weekend. They mentioned his name, and I was like, what? So I, until, I, I, if you had asked me this a week ago, I would have said no. So don't feel. I, t- <laughs> and like he's one of those dudes too, who I feel like has been around for like fifteen oh, years. Yeah. But you have Janoris Jenkins and Kristen. I think Kristen Fulton is their other cornerback, and they're not playing particularly good football. Uh, Fulton's playing a little bit better. Janoris Jenkins has a rating of like one hundred four against. And they're they're twenty fourth in, in past DVOA. They're twenty they're twenty fifth in past DVOA. Twenty fourth in run DVOA. Twenty sixth in total DVOA as a defense. So they're not that much better than Kansas City. They're a team that you know. I know in the Jets game they were down. They're two. They're only two receivers really in AJ Brown and 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 uh, Julio Jones. But it doesn't mean that it affects their defense. Their defense gave up 297 yards to Zach Wilson. And the Jets offense, who's been, as an offense, has been putrid this year. It they're just a lot of the issues that they had last year, they didn't do a lot to, to remedy. And I it's it's a defense uh, secondary that I think is going to be akin to, to Kansas City and the fact that they have a really good safety. And Kevin Bayard, who can who can cause some problems for this team, but I I really look for a pass heavy game in this one because of just how putrid I really think that secondary is for Tennessee. For me, I think the matchup that I'm looking at is this pass rush of Tennessee versus Buffalo because that's their strength on defense. Um, Harold Landry has been a pretty good pass rusher for them since he's become their you know on the team. You have Jeffrey Simmons, who, you know, killed the Bills in that matchup last season. Uh, I know they have Bud Dupree, who's coming off the ACL, so I know he's been a little slow, but still a good player. And and I think that is the strength of their defense. And this isn't to say that I don't think the Bills match up well against the Titans' D line, because I think their Bills, I think the Bills' offensive line can absolutely handle them. Um, but they, but they do have, but they, there are some good players, and and if they can neutralize what Tennessee does best, which is rush the passer with their D line. Um, that's huge for Buffalo. And not to mention, Ryan, just to go back to what you said about this being a, a pass-heavy game plan, not only is the secondary very shaky for Tennessee, but for a team that is run first, like the Titans are, what's the best way to essentially take that run game out of the game? It's to put up a ton of points and make them play from behind. And I think for the Bills, the best way to do that is like what they did against the Chiefs, explosive pass plays down the field, get up quickly and make them abandon the run with Derrick Henry as soon as they can. So I, 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 so, but to get back up with the matchup though, for me, yeah, it's, it's this, it's this Tennessee pass rush and it's this bills offensive line. Um, Cause the bills can stop that, that, I mean, Tennessee's defense is effectively, you know, kind of for lack of a better word, they're screwed if they can't get pressure on Josh Allen. And, you know, it's funny you, you mentioned the defensive line because, you know, Bud Dupree was been injured for a game. He only has, three pressures and in all the games he's played right now, Jeffrey Simmons, who they really rely on or thought they could rely on has three pressures in a second and a half through three games this year. Harold Landry's probably been one of their better edge rushers, but that's the unit that they thought they were going to lean on. And if it's not there, it's going to be a game where Josh can sit back and throw all day. You know, we, we, we talked about a second ago, you know, Janoris Jenkins been around the league for a while. So he's a guy who can maybe make some things happen just because he's a crafty vet who, who knows what he's doing. Kevin Bayard is, uh, is he's been a pro bowl safety. He's a really good safety. He's not like Tyron Matthew and Minka Fitzpatrick who can line up in 11 different spots on the field and, and change your game plan that way. But he's a guy that, you know, that I think you, you bank on, you know, if you're a Tennessee and you're trying to find a way to stop this offense, it's either I'm going to try to, you know, hope and pray that you can get to Josh Allen rushing four, or just try to hit him with some exotic blitzes. Or you just, you, 
try to steal some possessions by just throwing some exotic looks at him that I just don't think they can do. Yeah, and I do wonder if Tennessee uh, pulls out the game plan. The Bills just did a week ago and tries to just prevent any plays off of the top because um, that could be, you know, that's kind of what, what Pittsburgh did, just rush for and just keep, you know, seven to eight guys back deep in coverage. That being said, though, I mean, the Bills can run the ball, and I do think that if they were given a light box like that, they would just run the ball with Moss and Singletary. Um, but, we'll, but we'll see. But the Tennessee defense is going to have their hands full because, Ryan, let's just face it. I know you you know, you're, you brought up their DVOA. Um, they're just not a very good defense, and they're going against – the number one scoring offense in the NFL. So that, that is just a matchup that just favors the Bills so heavily. So we'll see what the Titans do, but I think I think Bills fans should be feeling um pretty good about this matchup offensively. But I think the matchup that everyone's really intrigued by, Ryan, is this Bills offense versus the Bill versus the Tennessee defense. Cause that's really, I think when you look back, when you think back to last year's game, right? That that awful was like it was like a Tuesday night game, uh, because all the rescheduling with COVID and you know, Derrick Henry sent Josh Norman to the next area code and Tannehill kind of lit him up. Oh yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just rough as a fan to watch that. Um, but this is definitely gonna be the, the big matchup that everyone, you know, is looking for. So what specifically in, in that matchup between Bill's defense, Tennessee offense, are you sort of focused on? I have, I have a question. How real is this Bill's run defense? We talked about it at the start of the year when they were starting off. Well, this is a team that even when they had really good defenses, hasn't necessarily really cared to stop the run or hasn't prioritized stopping the run. Is this run defense for real? Can they keep Derrick Henry subdued? Can they put this game in the hands of Ryan Tannehill and force him to be the guy that makes plays because Derrick Henry can, can change the game script. If you're letting him have one of his games where he's getting six yards of carry and he's just running and he's pulling up 200 yards, that that changes the game script. That changes the way you play. If they can keep Josh Allen off the field, that's what I'm looking at. And, you know, I know they've had success against guys who have gashed him before in Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, and just some of these other, be- you know, Najee Harris had, didn't do anything against this team, and no running back really had a monster game against this team to this point. But Derrick Henry is just a different animal, man. He there's not enough things you can say about him. He's a freak. He's, he's a six, three. He can run through you. He can run past you. The game, in my opinion, is going to be won or lost, or at least dictated on how well can Tennessee control the game with the run. I agree with you 100%. I think this game is all about, can the Bills defense stop Derrick Henry? And the thing that does make me feel optimistic about that is, is what was one of the storylines that the national, that, you know, the broadcast brought up with the Bills was, wow, look at this. They went 90 linemen deep, right? And they all were effective. And I think that what's kind of funny is they were saying that. Meanwhile, Harrison Phillips and Vernon Butler, your two backup one techs, didn't, were, were inactive for this game. It's Kansas City. I think you see the defensive line take a complete 180 as far as what they want to do. I, I think they, the Bills want to put as many, for, for again, for lack of a better way to say this, for, as many fat guys on, on the field that just take up space and that can just take on blocks and minimize you know, what Derrick Henry can do. So I do think that you're going to see a lot of Harry Phillips and, and Vernon Butler in this game. And this is why I do think that maybe the Bills have the personnel to prevent their Henry from going crazy because again last year they didn't really have a one tech and it hurt them and we'll see about that and hopefully Matt Milano can come back and help them but if if they can't stop the run not even just Derek Henry going off on them Ryan but it even it comes down to you know they can start running that play action pass and sure I know their receivers have been banged up but AJ Brown started to come back we'll see with Julio Jones they they got some weapons on the outsides that can burn you deep when they're healthy so if if you know if the Bills can't stop the run, that opens up that dimension for Tennessee and Tannehill and those bootlegs off play action. He's really good with that stuff. So they have to stop the run. This defense has to stop Derrick Henry in that run game because uh, if they don't, it's it's going to be a problem. I'll be fascinated to see how much of last week's physicality in the secondary. You know, I know Collins would do a lot right as a broadcaster in that game, but he did highlight 
the ways that Buffalo was just kind of bullying the the Chiefs wide receivers and pass catchers in that game. And they're going to kind of have to play the same kind of football this week because Julio Jones and A.J. Brown are both physical receivers who can beat you up and run past you. It's kind of like Derrick Henry. If Derrick Henry was a wide receiver, it – And you you look at guys that have at times given Trey White trouble, at times given Levi Wallace trouble, those uber physical guys can, could potentially be an issue. And if this game, you know, I think if there is a storyline, you know, how this game gets lost for Buffalo, they establish the run, they hit a play action pass to Julio, they hit a play action pass to to A.J. Brown, and they just let... Tennessee play ball control offense. You know, I I think if Buffalo loses this game, it's going to be a game where it's going to feel like Buffalo was on the field because Kansas city just kind of held the ball because they were, they, they had eight, nine minute drives with, with the way they can play offense if they want to. So it, it really comes down to take Derrick Henry away and then hope that, you know, I mean, Julio Jones is old, but he's still this generation's greatest wide receiver he can still make plays. It's like, uh, you know, they always say with like, you know, what they used to say with like old, like Barry Bonds or old, old sluggers came to the plate. Like, you know, they might not be what they used to, but if you give them a pitch down the plate, you give them a hanging curve, they're still going to take you long. You give, you give Julio Jones the right situation. He's still going to burn you. He can still have a big game on this team. So this is, you know, this is not an offense on par because of the quarterback with Kansas city, but this is probably, if you look at, the offensive weapons on this team from running back to what to both wide receivers is probably one of the besides Tampa Bay, one of the best teams will play left on their schedule. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. I mean the, the bills, you know, that that's, that's what it comes down to. And, and I got to ask you, Ryan, you know, when we kind of pick our players to watch here for, for this game against Tennessee, I mean, is yours Derek Henry? Is that the guy that you, you were honed in on or is there someone else that you feel is is a guy that we, you know on Tennessee that Bills need to look out for. I I picked Bud Dupree because oh, I know I I I know I know I just did a whole rant about how how Derrick Henry can flip the game script in this game, but Bud Dupree's not a bad player either. And just the same way that if Derrick Henry can control the game, it it'll it could change the game script if if Bud Dupree, who I'm sure is hungry, has not it's not signed a big contract and hasn't produced yet to this point. Yeah, I'm sure he's hungry for a sack. He's hungry to make an impact, and he's going he's going to be hunting out there. And if he can find a way to be that Pittsburgh Bud Dupree, you know, he could potentially, you know, make life hard on offense for the bills, you know, Kansas city didn't quite Frank Clark's not what it used to. The Kansas city didn't quite have that pass rusher with Chris Jones out of the game. So having can Bud Dupree have a, finally have a bounce back game against this team. He's going to be a guy I'm going to be watching heavily, especially start to uh, early in the game to see if he, if he's uh, how he's playing. So uh, speaking of guys, Ryan, that haven't maybe produced how we were thinking and how we were hoping, uh, that's kind of goes into the guy that I'm picking, which is AJ Brown. And AJ Brown is a guy that everyone was really high on. Obviously, he's had two straight thousand yard seasons, uh, but this year just hasn't quite been healthy and put it together. And you know, Ryan, I was looking back at the at the stats in that game a year ago, and AJ Brown. I know Trey White was not healthy, and Josh Norman was covering him the whole game, which was uh, of course a recipe for disaster. But AJ Brown was a real problem for Buffalo. He had seven catches for 82 yards and a score on that one. And he's a guy that can do it all. He can get, he can beat you down the field. He can run good routes and move the chains. He can catch a screen and take it to the house. He's a complete package. And like you mentioned, you know, the bills corners, although are generally very good, they're not the biggest guys. So sometimes these big physical freak receivers kind of beat them up a little bit outside. Now, We'll see what happens with Trey White on him, unless you know Julio Jones is healthy, which in that case, I don't know which guy Trey White's gonna necessarily cover. But AJ Brown's a guy to me that is just waiting to finally kind of explode and put up the numbers that people expected that he was this season. 
Um, so he's a he's a guy that I if I'm the Bills, I'm definitely keeping an eye out for because he he has some real great game breaking ability uh, along with you know Derrick Henry on that offense. Right, and and you know I think Tennessee is a team that isn't quite what their record says they are, even though they do have a Jets loss in there because they they do have offensive talent on this team and if it comes down to it if something goes wrong on defense they can they can stay in a shootout if they need to so it, it, i think this is a lot like you know it, i think tennessee is going to be a lot like almost a diet last week that it, it it's just going to come down to can can tennessee find a way to to keep up with the bills offense absolutely and i think the kind of Transition us perfectly to score predictions. I mean, Ryan, when it comes down to it, you know, we're games in uh, about five days from when this episode's going to release. Monday Night Football in Nashville, your score, who wins, and what happens? I have 34 24 Buffalo. It could be more than that. I just, I hate picking blowouts. It, I think it's a, te- a game that Bills just dominate, or it, it's never really close. You know, maybe Kansas City, or Kansas City, Tennessee holds on in the first half, but it, I, I just you go player to player on this team on uh, Bills of Tennessee, and it, there's just not a lot of ways they match up, especially on defense. And this could be another game where I know I picked 34, but this is this could be another game where the Bills could put up 40 easily. I have um a score kind of similar to that. Uh, I have Buffalo winning this one. 31 23 uh, but i don't think it's necessarily as close as that score sounds i'm more just kind of adding the fact that maybe tennessee scores a touchdown sort of in garbage time if you will um i agree with you though i just think that tennessee's defense i just and i'm not speaking this as a from a bills fan i'm just saying from a football perspective i just don't think they match up well at all with this buffalo offense i think they have a very as out of kevin byer their defense their secondary is really questionable and you know, the Bills obviously are so deep at receiver. And even the Tennessee tight end, or uh, not tight ends, uh, excuse me, the linebackers, you know, aren't, aren't that great. And after what we've seen from Dawson Knox through five games, that's a guy that maybe the Bills really want to feature in the game plan too. Um, so I just think that the Bills just have a little too much firepower offensively for that Tennessee defense to hang in there. And I just think the Bills defense will get some, will get enough stops in this game that will just really you know, put Tennessee behind. So yeah, I have bills winning 31, 23, uh, in this game. Yep. Uh, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. I don't well, one thing as we head out, I don't, I feel like we haven't done, a, we haven't promoted this enough, but if you're looking for pregame content, there's a Buffalo fanatics tailgate that happens. I don't know how long yep. the game it'll be on Monday. Um, I think I'll be on it this week. Uh, so if you're, if you don't, if you're looking for something else besides WGR before the game or, or, Besides uh, the ESPN uh, pregame show, we will be on, uh, I think, I don't know, sorry, at six, I don't know. Judge will put it out. Follow Judge Mathis, our air rated, our Buffalo Fanatics, they'll put it out. But uh, if you're looking for pregame content, watch the Buffalo Fanatics tailgate. I don't know how often we've we promoted that on here. So uh, check that out if, if, if you, at least while I'm, I think I'll be there on, on Mon- Monday. I almost said Sunday, Monday. <laughs> yeah definitely check that out i mean that takes you right up to kickoff I, I i think ryan yeah i think you're right i think it starts about two hours usually before kickoff and they got everything on from a round table discussion um out you know uh to uh thigh doctor coming on giving you guys kind of his injury update especially once the inactives come out so and you kind of get it all there and his thigh yes yeah, so if you want to if you if you're looking for all that and more uh definitely tune into to the tailgate uh the be of tailgates on youtube uh live stream uh, so definitely check that out, along with everything else too that you know is being produced here at BF, whether it's you know podcasts, any live streams that you see guys doing, uh, articles that are coming out daily. Check it all out because uh, this is a really, really exciting time to be a fan of this football team as they sort of come into their own and are starting to get you know praised as the best team in the NFL. Can can, can you believe that that we're the Bills are the best team in the NFL? It's it's, 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 it's surreal. surreal. Now what one it's question? Surreal. One question before we get out of here now, with the Bills playing on Sunday, are you someone who turns on the red zone or do you pick one game and, and stay there for the afternoon? See, I'm a big red zone guy. And I know sometimes they don't show you the game you want, sometimes, but but I, I think that generally speaking, I think red zone, specifically in that one o'clock window, I know we love the one o'clock Bills games. 
But red zone at one o'clock with when there's it was like what is it, like eight nine games going on all at once. It's really fun to just get constant action tossed around. So I'm a big just throw it on the red zone all day. Except my roommate is a Steelers fan, so I'm sure uh, whenever the when the Steelers play, actually they're on Sunday night, so that's even perfect. So I can I can just have the red zone on the whole time. Never mind. Uh, so yeah, how about you, Ryan? You you a big red zone guy? Are you a I, stick to I, one game? I, I like it towards the end. I get a little too discombobulated when they have when it's on during uh, like the middle of a game if there's a bunch of games coming close at the end. But I don't know. I like to pick one game or flip between a couple games. Uh, I don't know. I like the, I like because I know we have both have still Sunday tickets. So I know it's it's I and I like to pick unless I like to go to a game that's close. And if none of the games are close, I'll do red zone. Fair enough there. Fair enough there. All right. So. That about does it here for the 585 report. We appreciate all your support and you guys checking out our content, listening to our podcast, whether it's on Spotify or Apple or whatever you listen to your podcast to, or whether you are watching us currently on YouTube. Uh, we really appreciate that all. And with that being said, for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great rest of your day.